Hey everyone, glad to be back with you all again. I'd been looking for a chance to go back and replay Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, but the right moment never seemed to come around. Until now, that is. Yes, the announcement and first trailer of the upcoming remake convinced me that now would be as good a time as any. The game obviously holds a strong place in a lot of our hearts, especially with the influence it would have on later games like the Assassin's Creed series. But what to think of it now? 2003 was a very long time ago, and game development has come quite a long way since then. Although the visuals of the PC version are still considered to be the best, I went with the PS3 HD trilogy set for this video for one main reason. Controls. I've tried out the keyboard controls for this game before, as well as a USB gamepad through the manual setup, and it just never felt quite as fluid to me as using said controller on the console versions. While I do understand it still works well overall, and know that you can even get a nifty looking 1080p widescreen display going through mods, I found it much more sensible to just use the version of the game that comes with the smoother controls built in, even if the visuals are considered a slight downgrade at 720p. I've heard that the Xbox One backward compatible version also looks great, but unfortunately I no longer own my original Xbox copy to play it with. Hope that's okay with you all. With that said, let's take a look and see just how well Prince of Persia The Sands of Time holds up today. Developed by Ubisoft Montreal and published by Ubisoft in 2003, Prince of Persia The Sands of Time is a reboot of the original Prince of Persia from 1989. The title is an action-adventure game with a heavy focus on platforming and puzzle solving, and a slightly lesser focus on its combat. Jordan Mechner, developer of the original Prince of Persia and its sequel, Prince of Persia 2, The Shadow and the Flame, was brought back on as a designer, scenario writer, and creative consultant. While the concept for the original was mainly inspired by 1001 Nights, also known as Arabian Nights, Sands of Time would take its inspiration from the epic poem of Saname, translated to The Book of Kings. First written by poet Abalkwasem Ferdowski, it would describe details from the history of the world all the way up to the dawn of Persian civilization, which in turn would also work as a blueprint for Mechner to pull all kinds of ideas from. Here's the story we got. The prince takes part in the siege led by his father Sharaman, king of Persia, against the Maharaja, the ruler of India. This siege began after the Maharaja's vizier convinced King Sharaman to attack with honor and glory as the prize. As the prince fights onward and makes his way into the treasure vault, he comes across a mysterious dagger known as the Dagger of Time. This allows the prince to control time in various ways, such as slowing it down or reversing it to avoid death. After bringing both this dagger and the hourglass containing the sands of time to their sultan, the prince is tricked by the vizier into using the dagger and opening the hourglass. This causes everyone except for the prince, the vizier, and the maharaja's daughter, Farah, to turn into sand creatures, setting the stage for the rest of the game. It's up to the prince and Farah to save everyone and undo the horrors let loose by the vizier's treachery. The sands of time. I can undo what you have done. Give it to me. No. This brings us to the gameplay, which is by far the biggest focus of the title. Your left analog stick can move you in all directions, while the right one helps control and adjust your camera. This is good, because while the camera is fixed in places for cinematic effect, you can usually adjust it whenever something feels off. The prince can also jump, as well as bounce off walls, sometimes even reaching new heights with it. The same button will also allow him to dodge oncoming attacks from enemies. Shoulder buttons allow you to run up or along walls to reach more distance, or block enemy attacks if you're in combat. There are two fight buttons, one for slashing and the other for doing a special ability called Sand Retrieve, which the prince can activate once he knocks down an enemy. This retrieves the sand that transformed the creature in the first place and basically finishes off the enemy for good. Those are the basics, but there are plenty of variations to these controls that lead to all kinds of amazing feats and acrobatics. Whether it's swinging from pole to pole, running along a wall, only to jump off it onto a pillar, dodging rotating buzz saws, or somehow combining all these tricks into one platforming section, you know you've got your work cut out for you. But let's face it, you'll die in this game. A lot. Well, the game's creative team thought about that too, and came up with something slightly more forgivable. The Dagger of Time can be used not only to slow down time or freeze enemies during combat, but to reverse time itself. Yes, this one simple feature allows the prince to retry failed jumps or undo attacks from enemy sand creatures based on however many sand tanks you have to accomplish this. If you run out of sand tanks and die, however, then you die for real and have to retry from your last checkpoint. At least you can drink from fountains to heal, right? 
The game's combat is also very tricky at times, though mainly consists of the same set of moves. Unlike other games of its time, The Sands of Time allows you to fight and strike at multiple enemies simultaneously, instead of just forcing you to go for one at a time. On top of blocking and dodging, as I mentioned earlier, you can also vault over enemies by running toward them and hitting jump. This will allow the prince to get behind enemies and get in a strike or two. Some creatures will be able to block this move, but it becomes pretty invaluable early on. There's also a special attack called Mega Freeze that will, as the name says, freeze all enemies and allow the prince to get a quick strike in and finish off everything around him. This, of course, consumes a large amount of sand and requires you to get more from enemies in order to use it again. Farah also helps you in combat with her bow and arrow, and I admit, she was more useful than most friendly AI that I had experienced in games up to that point. The final element to the gameplay is puzzle solving, which you'll also be doing quite a bit of here. Some can range from hitting a switch, opening a door, and moving on, but others involve multiple segments and sometimes a bit of trial and error along the way. Some doors will only stay open for a brief period of time, making the prince have to hurry across in order to reach the door before it closes. While these can be a bit confusing at times, I found some of them to be very creative. My personal favorite was this segment, where you have to activate the palace's defense system by moving large pillars of a machine into matching up with signs pertaining to the different phases of the moon. It took a while to get the hang of, but once finished, it left me feeling very accomplished, and the whole thing was absolutely beautiful to look at. I knew you could do it! Speaking of beauty, while I know the graphics do look a tad dated compared to today's current gaming climate, I still think they look good enough that it won't bother the person playing. The facial animations in general still look very smooth and expressive. The art style in general is also quite nice on the eyes, even if it does appear to showcase a few too many cliches from time to time. Thankfully there's more to do than just go the straightforward route at all times, as there are plenty of hidden items to find as well. There are multiple healing fountains which will increase your maximum health, and sand clouds that will increase your number of sand tanks the more that you collect. While it doesn't add much to the replay value, it does give you another reason to fully explore your surroundings. You'll notice that the game does not have a large amount of cutscenes in it, though they do appear from time to time. That's because the developers wanted to incorporate as much story into the gameplay as possible. That way, it would feel more like you were living out the story than if you had to sit back and watch most of it play out. I feel that this was the right decision to make, as it certainly did make the events feel as if they were happening more in real time. I particularly enjoyed the banter between Farah and the Prince, who helped carry sections of the game that would have otherwise been quiet and awkward. I'll meet you on the other side of that gate! Careful! You be careful! The music is another strong point, as it also helps keep you engrossed in the world and the story you're taking part in. The pacing of this game is another strong suit as well, in my opinion, as it's just long enough to feel like a complete story, while leaving you wanting just a little more in the end. The story beats and progression felt natural, all the way up to the prince getting his ultimate sword with the ability to take down enemies in one strike, including those large ones that kept giving you so much trouble before. And while the game lacks in boss fights, the final battle does at least scratch that itch for something a little bigger to contend with. The vizier runs behind a protected magical wall and forces you to fight an avatar of himself three times before you're finally able to finish him off. While the fight wasn't particularly challenging or creative, it did change things up in a game where combat desperately needed things to be changed up. I also liked the way the game wouldn't continue until you finished off the Vizier for good at the end. And although the Prince's interactions with Farah in the final scenes are a little anticlimactic, they are nonetheless realistic in their tone. After turning back time in order to save Farah and prevent the horrible attacks on the palace, it is revealed that the Prince's entire narrative throughout the game was to Farah recounting the entire tale up to the point of the final fight with the vizier. She sees the prince's story as nothing more than fantasy and refuses his attempt to kiss her, being as the memories they shared of being close are now gone. After this, he turns back time once more, and when Farah asks why he thought she would believe such a fantastical story and to give his name, he simply responds with Kakalukium, a word Farah had kept secret up until these recent events and had revealed to the prince earlier. It was meant to be used for opening a secret door, and was also uttered by Farah once more before her death scene. Using this word was the prince's last resort to convincing Farah of the truth, and leading up to the game's credits. Somber, but effective. So surely the game has its share of flaws, right? Yes, and some of these have aged less than gracefully. The first and most obvious issue revolves around the game's camera. The game tries to create a mix of areas with a fully rotatable camera, while switching to a completely fixed camera in other places, only allowing you to shift the view from right to left a little. 
This can actually cause quite a few problems in both platforming and in combat. In the case of platforming, in a game where timing and direction is very important, a slight change of camera can be the issue that causes you to fall to your death, or miss an important jump completely. The fixed angles can also make it difficult to see where you're even supposed to go on occasion. For example, in this segment, where you're supposed to jump off a rock onto a branch of this coconut tree in order to reach a switch over the Sultan's Zoo, the distance is not made very clear, and caused me to fall to my death multiple times just guessing where in the heck I was supposed to go. While these segments are pretty infrequent overall, they do appear more than once and can be quite headache inducing. The first person view helps things a bit, but it only goes so far. The camera can also become a major issue in combat, particularly when you're in close quarters. If there are any walls or pillars around you, it's not uncommon for them to block your view and force you to move the camera in the middle of hacking at your enemies. While it's certainly possible to work around, it just feels like an unnecessary annoyance most of the time. The combat itself also has one major flaw. Despite being ambitious in its scope to allow you the chance to fight multiple enemies at once, there is no form of targeting system. The prince simply slices at whatever enemy is closest to him. As you can imagine, this causes all kinds of problems, particularly if you're trying to strategize against multiple enemy types. For example, in this shot I was trying to vault run up one of the smaller enemies before slashing at the tall one, but instead the prince tried to vault run up the large one due to it being the closest, causing him to get knocked down and the whole strategy to fail. This would of course be perfected in future entries of the series, as well as the other games inspired by it, but in this case it was quite frustrating to deal with. And don't get me started on this elevator section that ended up being far more annoying than necessary. I lost count of how many times I had to retry this part due to said camera and lock-on issues. The last complaint, though a little minor in comparison, is that the enemy variety is also quite lacking. After fighting with the same few enemy types for hours on top of using the same fight techniques again and again, you start to feel a wave of repetition kick in. Thankfully, it's overshadowed by the game's other elements, but it should still be noted. With all of that said, I still believe the good far outweighs the bad, and that's what really matters here. The platforming, especially after you get into the swing of things, is absolutely smooth and fluid, and the biggest highlight here. These movements, combined with the creative setting and stage design, and the now famous time-turning mechanics, gave us something truly special. On top of the various sequels, the game's influence would reach all over the place, from now popular titles like Assassin's Creed, the Batman Arkham games, and even the latest Spider-Man games from Insomniac, all the way to indie favorites like Braid. And with a new remake on the way, and the perspective of new enhancements to remove annoyances present in this original version, the series might just be able to work that magic once again. But whether or not that happens, I'm happy to say that the original is still a wonderful game in its own right, that deserved its legendary status then, and still deserves to be played, even now. And that's going to do it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. Have you played this game yourself? Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below. And if you're feeling generous, please consider donating to my Patreon, where awesome people like Erica, Brandon, and Johan all help keep this channel going strong. Until next time.